Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the day that you've given us, for the precious salvation we find in Christ Jesus alone. Lord, we ask that you be with us now as we open your word. Help us, as always, to remain focused and fixed on you, returning that gift of Christ with thanksgiving and praise in our hearts, Lord. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. Again, I want to thank you for being here. What is your purpose in life? How many think we know that? None of us? All right. Well, then this will help you find why you are here, okay? In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 20 and 21, if you want to turn there, it's right after the book of Psalms. Chapter 19, I'll be reading verse 20 and 21. Actually, it's on the screen. Listen to advice and accept instruction. Boy, listen to advice and accept instruction. That's a message in itself. <coughs> But it says, and in the end, you will be what? Wise. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. God, folks, is not going to be stopped in his tracks for anything. He has a plan, and he wants us to understand his plan. We have two ways in which purpose works. First of all, it works throughout the world. God has a world picture of what he's seen. And Wednesday nights we're in the book of Revelation and we're in 14 and 15. And uh, things are getting pretty rough in this world. And folks, we need to know what's happening. And guess what? If you know Christ is your personal savior, you're going to find that you're not going to be here anyhow. But revelation is so that we might see what's going on in this world and how it applies to our lives. This second man here in this verse, the foolish one, is only interested in today, not tomorrow. He has no plan, he has no purpose for tomorrow. We can't live that way, folks. Here's the definition of purpose. According to Webster, he says it is an object to be reached or accomplished, an end or an, or an aim, that which a person intends to do, a design or a plan. Let me say this. I'm glad that each one of you is here. There's two ways that those of you who may not have been here before, or maybe a couple of times, we're calling them guests. And I thank each one of our guests for being here this morning. And I thank the Lord for those of you who are listening via the web. I call our people here this morning guests. You see, there's a difference between calling someone a visitor and someone calling a guest. A visitor is one who comes unexpectedly. You had no idea that, that they were going to come, but they do. That is a visitor. A guest is one who is expected, like every one of you. We expected you to be here. And think of this, God directed you here, whether you're a member of longstanding at this church or not. He directed you here for today. And the same thing is true with our guests. And we prepared ourselves for your coming and being with us. And we thank the Lord so much for your presence. With our lives changing every day, it seems, 
and our world is in total chaos, knowing what direction we're going and how we can be going in that direction to get where we want to be. Understanding our purpose in all this that's going on is vitally important to you, to your family, your relatives, your church family, your friends, and your neighbors. Knowing your purpose is so important, folks, to your future. Someone once said this, if you don't have a goal to shoot at, that is purpose, you will miss the target. And how true that is. That's why it's important that we know the purpose for which we are here, whether we're retired or whether we're still working. There are a few things in life that are more important than knowing your purpose. You ever wonder why God didn't take you the instant you got saved, why he didn't take you home? Think about that. What is he doing? God wants you to be a witness and testimony to everybody around you. God wants you to be able to talk to someone about the Lord Jesus Christ, why he came, why he died, why he shed his blood, and why he rose again from that grave. He did that for you and for me. So God has a purpose for every one of us that knows that heaven is our home beyond any shadow of a doubt. He has a purpose for you and for me that we need to carry out for him. I read an illustration a few weeks ago that fits well into this message. Let's say a boss comes to you and he says, I want you to work on Saturday. You haven't worked on Saturday for years, but now this guy is going to work on Saturday. And the boss says, come in at 9 o'clock. All right. He's a little disturbed with this. He didn't like working the weekends. As a matter of fact, he already had plans for some other things to take place. And he had to put them aside. He had to call them. And then the boss said, I have 10,000 envelopes that I want you to open up check the contents and when you're finished with the 10,000th one you can go home well the boss failed to mention that he was going to get some extra money so this guy figured well I'm going to have to come on Saturday never did that before and now I have to open up 10,000 envelopes and I don't even know what I'm looking for well, the boss knew that the man was a little disturbed by everything that was going on, so guess what? The boss said, I want, you to, I want to add something to that. One of those 10,000 envelopes has a $100,000 check in it made in your name. <laughs> now you can see the excitement that this guy had working on 10,000 envelopes. You see, there was a plan, there was a purpose in what he was supposed to be doing. The purpose, of course, was with the boss, but also now it was with him. Here's the problem. $100,000 check made out to you is the bonus. Opening those envelopes took on new meaning, didn't they? and you were opening them with enthusiasm. Same tedious job. The difference is the perception of the purpose. The purpose and what he thought about it. Knowing that God has a purpose for you would transform how you see things in your own personal lives. What you do with your blessings and how you would interpret what God wants you to do is how you understand God's Word. That's why important folks, we are in the Word of God constantly. Unfortunately, what we do is we 
we come here with our Bibles and we might turn to the page or we might take a look on the cell phone and see the verses, go home, put the Bible on the, on the top shelf and let it collect dust and it starts all over again. It's important that you and I know the Word of God. Let me make this clear. When you receive Christ as your personal Savior, you are given at least one gift so you can serve Him in one way through the church of which you are a part. Did you hear what I said? God has given every one of us in here a purpose. And he's given us one gift at least. Some of you have two, maybe three, maybe four different kinds of gifts that you can use for the Lord. What would you do with the blessings you receive because you're serving God? You're opening those envelopes, remember, with enthusiasm. Now you have the gift that's going to be able to define what your life is all about. What you would do with those blessings and how you would interpret what God is, is wanting you to do with that means that you're going to need to get busy. God expects you to be used for Him. So how can you learn what your purpose in life is for you? I'll try to help you with that. If you would, I would like you to take your uh, Bibles and turn to Psalm 57. Psalm 57. And David is speaking here. We have to understand that much of the book of Psalms is a song. Okay, this music that words were put to like this in chapter 57. David begins, he says, have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me. For in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings under the disaster, until the disaster has passed. Folks, what David is feeling and knowing is that the army of Israel is looking for him to kill him. As a matter of fact, his son is after him to kill him. So when David says here that there is disaster, but now it's past, it's because they couldn't find him. Now, let me say this, they are continuing to look for him, but they couldn't find him here in this particular place. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster is past. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose, his purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me rebuking those uh, who hotly pursue me. God sends his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I lie among the raven beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp words. Be exalted, that's what we just saw, sang. He says here, be exalted, O God. That means be placed above everything else, anything else that might be in your life at that particular moment. God is to be exalted. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread a net for my feet, and I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen in themselves. My heart is steadfast, okay, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul, awake harp and lyre, and I will awaken at dawn. I will praise you, O oh God, among the nations. I will sing of you among the people. For great is your love teaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let the glory 
be over all of the earth. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, how many churches throughout the world are exalting you? are praising you and giving you the glory that you deserve. Unfortunately, there are too many churches that have gone the way of uh, entertainment more than anything. They've missed the goal, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So be with us this morning. Clear our mind with those things that might cause us to miss something that would be meaningful in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 57 is an amazing portion of Scripture. In spite of all the things that were going wrong in David's life, in spite of the fact that he was suffering both mentally and physically in a cave, that's where he was hiding. David never asked God to change his situation. You know, too often we do that. We find ourselves in a storm of life, we take our eyes off of God, we place it on the storm that we're going through, we ought to reverse that because it's going to be God who works things out so that the storm will not destroy you or cause you problems. So the only thing he, that David asked throughout this book of Psalms is this, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all of the earth, verse 5. So we know then we have to change our perspective in things. David could have said, hey, Lord, you sure have given me uh, a lousy place to lay my head. I don't even have a comfortable chair to sit in. God, what are you doing? I don't even have a place. I don't even have a number bed so that I am able to sleep on those numbers. I don't deserve this. This cave is a dump. That's the direction that David could have gone with this. But he was steadfast, according to the Word of God, steadfast in God's Word. Okay, things are going to get tough for you. Things get tough with me. And just because we're a Christian doesn't mean that we aren't going to ever have any problems, difficulties, or storms coming into our life. Those things are going to happen. How you come out of them is dependent upon what God is going to do in your life and how you pray about it. David could have wanted all these things. He could have wanted the number bed. He could have wanted a chair. But he sees something as, that is much bigger, folks, than the little picture that he had. God sees everything, folks. We see just a little bit. And God's going to watch over us. So here we find, what did David do? He saw the bigger picture, and he see, the Bible says he prayed. He prayed. Twice it says that. He prayed. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let people see how you use this problem to show your majesty. That's what this is all about. Now, unfortunately, we have a tendency to look at our problem and not at God. We try to get through on our own terms and in our own strength. And I'm, I'm guilty of that as well. We take our eyes off the Lord, but he is the one who has the answer to our troubles. Not me, not you. We don't see the bigger picture. Now once again, in Psalm 57 verse 2, it tells us, I cry out to the Lord Most High, to God, who fulfills my, excuse me, his purpose for me. That means you have to be in touch with God. That means you need to be on a speaking level with the Lord. Not that you ought to have a, a flowery uh, prayer with words that are 10 miles long. Just talk to the Lord like you normally would talk to one another. That's what God wants, the conversation of your voice calling upon him. Now, I want you to think about this. David wants God to receive the glory, not him. 
Think about this. Who created the earth? Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declared the glory of the Lord. The skies proclaimed the work of his hands. Folks, God created the earth to give him glory. That's why all of this is here. Depending on what you and I do with God's creation is going to depend upon how much glory he is going to get. David said, yet he saved them for his name's sake. That's what God did to make his mighty power norm, uh, known. Psalm 106, verse 8. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 1, 6 that God chose to save us in a way that he did to put on a display of his glorious grace. I wonder how many of us have someone who would die for us. Jesus died for every one of us in here. He died for people that are out there in the world. He died for you, me, and for them. David says that the reason God continues to work in his life is for glory that only can be for his name's sake. Huh. Psalm 23, 3. It says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So, what is the ultimate purpose God has for you and for me? It's strange how this works. Give him the glory. That's where it is. Give him the glory. That's what he wants, to be glorified. Whatever we do, we should share God's love with other people. If he didn't love you, we'd all be bound to hell today. Everything God created, the Bible says, it was good. Every time. It was good. The last thing God created was man and woman. So why was this so special? Why did God see that Adam and Eve were so special in his creation? Well, God created every one of us in his, what, image. There is something about God, folks, that looks like us. We often refer to his eyes or his mouth, uh, he, the words that he speaks. There's something in you and me that looks like God. But if you look around this uh, auditorium this morning, God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? <laughs> God created every one of us in his image, folks. He wants to be the center of our lives. Not out there in the perimeter somewhere. He wants to be the center. So we're allowing God to work in our life and make things work for us as well. On our computers, and I'm no geek, I'll tell you, there is something called default setting. So what that means, and James, you might have to correct me a little bit here, it means that the things that are on the screen will be set aside. So you can go back to it again and again and again. Is that anywhere like it, James? Sure. Oh, good. <laughs> he's going to take, yeah, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to take me by the hair and go to my office. But the computer is a, an amazing technological instrument. Let me summarize how some of us pray. I want, I want, I want. Usually what happens is that we have focused upon the storm, the problem, and we want. God, we want you to get me out of this. God, we want you to supply this. God, this is what I need. That's where our prayer 
usually begins. And maybe later on in that prayer you might acknowledge God. Hey God, are you really listening to me? I'm in, a, in, in the center of things here now, God, so take care of me. That's the way we pray sometimes. Here's the problem with that prayer. God huh, doesn't answer prayer the way you expected him to. So what happens? You get angry at God. What's the problem? Don't you get it, God? God, it's about my glory. It's about what I can get, about my happiness. God, where are you? Why is this happening to me? We live as if God existed to glorify us because we have placed ourselves in the center and everything else evolves around us. I want you to listen to something. God is more interested in your character than your comfort. This life that we live is just temporary, folks. Just a warm up for eternity. I think that if our church services were to go two, maybe three hours, and there are some churches in our area that do that. I'm not sure that many of you'd be here if that's the way we always did things. So that's why I only, uh, we'll be out by one o'clock, okay? We're going that way. Can we do a break in between? No. <laughs> David found refuge in God. He ran for his life and God led him to a cave. Now I want you to listen to this. David's refuge wasn't in the cave where he was hiding. His refuge was in God, steadfast in love and grace. You see that? God's purpose for you is not so much something that you are doing for him, but the way you learn to depend upon him for whatever is taking place in your life. Folks, we aren't saved because God has something he wants us to do. God could do it himself. But he doesn't. He gets you and me involved. The greatest, the greatest blessing you can receive is when you do something, serve God some way, somehow. And God will bless you beyond anything you can imagine. The blood of the Lord Jesus is so powerful that he shed at Calvary's cross, it can wash away every sin. As a matter of fact, he tells us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You might do the same sin over and over again. You go to God and you're, you, you, you're guilty, you feel that guilty uh, thing, and now... You're coming to God asking him to forgive you again. Well, guess what? God's blood is powerful enough to save you. It is powerful enough to forgive you of your sin. As a Christian, that's why it begins if we confess. That's with the mouth, folks. Now, I want you to listen. God has needs. What we do for him isn't nearly as important as who we become in him. Are you the same that you were before you got saved? Does anything, has anything changed in your life? That's what he's saying. God has needs, but nothing that we can provide for him. 
He wants us to realize that he is the refuge that we need in our life, not some cave. Romans 8, 28. It's on the screen. And we know that in all things God works for what? Good. For those who what? Love him. Who have been called according to his purpose. You see that? God is there, but he isn't going to be where he's not wanted. God is there for you when you trip and fall. He is there to forgive you, but it comes from forgiveness because you have confessed your sin. It's okay to pray to God to give you victory over a certain situation that you have. Exalt him. That's what that song was about. Exalt him. Here's what you need to include in your prayer. God glorify your name through me. I often pray, God, may you increase and may I decrease. I want God to have number one in my life, to be the center of my life. And you can have the same thing. You don't have to be a preacher. You can, live, you, you can work at the dump. And if you know Christ is your Savior, you can go to him in prayer anywhere for any reason. God glorify your name through me. Help me to know you more than I did when I came through the doors of this church this morning. Hmm. Help me to know my purpose is in a greater way than I ever have known before. Why are you still here? Why didn't God take you to heaven the moment you trusted in him as your personal savior? Why didn't he take you? Because he wants you to be a witness and testimony for him. Romans 10, 9. You've already heard it. If you confess with your mouth, something has to be said, folks, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be what? Uh, huh? What's it say? What's that word? Saved. Yeah. Saved. I thought that was a Baptist word. I thought it was an Assembly of God word. I thought it was a Pentecostal word. But it's not. Oh, they're all included in that, and this church as well is included in that, but it's the people that make up the church, not this physical building. You're here, and we have church this morning. So he tells us that we need to believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. Then you will be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, made right, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are what? Saved. saved. This church, just you being here, isn't going to get you saved, folks. There is no church no denomination in the world that can save you by itself. It is the people that make up the church and it's the preaching and the teaching and the singing of the word of God that brings you to him and your sins are forgiven. That's what it's all about. So what is your purpose in life? Well, let me tell you one thing. You're to be a witness and testimony for the Lord. That's what you're supposed to do. He tells us that right here in his word. Let's bow in prayer. Our gracious Father, you're such a good God. Lord, we want to exalt you this morning. We want you to be in the center of our lives, not us. 
because we are weak. We are sinful by our very nature. And Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts during our invitation to him, that, that, that they would come desiring Christ in their lives, that they would come to be forgiven of those sins that are repeated over and over again in their lives. Speak to us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, shall we, as we sing. And why don't you come this morning as God speaks to your heart?